been working together quite closely, actually, um, in the past years. Uh, so I'm really hope, hoping that Bata and I, we are both new, and we both aim to strengthen this collaboration between our institutes. We're also so close to each other. Uh, so we have already invited each other to uh, travel to each other's institute and spend a day there. And so once the travel allows us, then I would be very happy to do that. And uh, I'm really happy to be invited and very pleased also to have Dominic with me here because as I mentioned in my email, he is a award winning uh, junior researcher at the Institute. His master thesis was awarded uh, a prize by the German Committee for Disaster Risk Reduction. And he's a very valued uh, colleague here. Uh, the topic of today is tackling climate risks in urban re regions, uh, relevance, approaches, and solutions. So let me start with uh, relevance. Why is this topic uh, relevant? On the top of the slide, you can see that there are five reasons for concerns on the right hand side of the top part of the slide. Um, all of them are equally important, but today we only take one example, which is extreme weather events. Um, this uh, five reasons for concerns is a concept created or developed by IPCC. So if you look at the figure, you will see um, with 1.5 degrees temperature um, increase, which is agreed uh, in the Paris Agreement, we will face much more frequent and much more extreme and heavier uh, events, uh, weather-related, climate-related events. Uh, this is something uh, which causes uh, a big concern. And the likelihood uh, that it happens is very uh, big. Um, and then this is coupled by another global trend, which is the global population development. Uh, as you know, may, as you may know, that 50% uh, of the world population lives in um, urban areas currently. And uh, according to their projection, until 2050, there will be 68% of urban population. Uh, so that means in figure 2.5 to 3 billion people more who will live in urban areas. If you combine uh, these two trends together, then you can see that the risks in urban areas which are related to climate will increase because exposure increases due to the population growth. And this trend also has a, a certain char characteristic, which is that the biggest growth rate will take place in uh, small and medium-sized cities in Asia and um, Africa. Um, this is a, a research landscape of UNU EHS. Uh, you can see that we not only conduct research in Global South, but mainly in Global South, but also research in Global uh, North. The two uh, green dots on the map are the two projects uh, Dominic and I will present in a bit more detail. If you look at the left um, corner below, you will see a globe. Underneath the globe, there are two projects listed. One is uh, Globe Drought, another one is Wando. And these two projects both have global scale, but also have case studies. That means we not only have a geographical scope of uh, globally um, set, set um, projects, we also really zoom in and uh, talk to the communities on the ground, talk to vulnerable people on the ground um, with case studies. Um, now we can already dive in the Flat Adapt Vietnam project. Uh, why we have chosen um, Vietnam as a, a study site is because Vietnam is a very long country, has a very long coastal uh, line and uh, huge population concentrates along the coastal 
uh, areas and all the assets are also concentrated along the coastal line. Uh, and these areas are exposed to multi-hazards. If you think of um, sea level rise, um, storm surges, uh, landslides, and of course also uh, flooding events, which we are talking about today in this presentation. And uh, this, reason, uh, this region, especially the central uh, Vietnam region, is uh, faced uh, the population growth, uh, which is very much in line with the global trend of population uh, development. Um, in the meantime, this region uh, is also facing a huge increase in precipitation and heavy rainfall events. Uh, this has increased uh, flooding in, in these areas as well. Um, it's, it's, sometimes I'm a bit ashamed to say if I see a disaster event, I'm kind of happy. Uh, it's really bad to say that um, because people are suffering. But um, as it's happened this year, we have chosen this uh, study site before, but in October, from the 6th October to the 18th October, uh, there was a very recent flood event, which gives uh, our research even more justification um, for it. Um, so this flood event has affected 5 million people and uh, more than 135 houses were damaged um, and uh, a lot of assets were just uh, lost in this area. In spite of uh, all these consequences caused by flooding events, uh, which basically uh, takes place every two years on average, uh, if you look at the last two decades, uh, still there is a huge uh, knowledge gap. We identified the knowledge gap by reviewing 77 publications uh, to uh, identify what kind of knowledge gaps are existing and persisting. So these uh, are uh, information and data on the drivers and uh, spatial concentration of uh, damage and uh, vulnerable areas. Uh, and also there's uh, hardly any data on solutions uh, to reduce flood risk. Uh, not many data uh, exist or measures have been implemented in terms of risk transfer, which can largely reduce flood risk. Uh, so all of these, um, uh, also not to mention uh, adaptation measures, all of these are lacking or insufficient. Um, the existing measures for floods prevention is largely engineering. Um, I don't want to generalize it, but uh, Vietnam does have a very similar centralized structure to China. I did my field work back in 2004 and 2005 in Wuhan, uh, which is now very famous because of um, coronavirus. Back then, it was just one of the Chinese cities along the Yangtze River. And there, I also found out that uh, if you talk about uh, flood prevention, people think about engineered measures. They build dikes, and then, then they build uh, uh, higher and higher dikes to prevent flood. Uh, they give the reason we have population pre pressure, uh, we cannot create more intention area, but the same argument appears again and again. Even in Chinese Han time, that was 73 after, uh, 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 after Christ, um, uh, people uh, were already arguing that they couldn't create more retention area due to population growth. So I can also observe a very similar phenomenon in uh, Vietnam. Um, here you can see more pictures uh, from this very recent flood uh, event uh, in October. Uh, in part of the city, uh, the city are meters deep in uh, water. So you can see that there is really a big demand for solutions. With our project, um, Flood Adapt Vietnam, uh, we have the overall 
aim to develop a framework for disaster risk, risk reduction, uh, risk transfer, uh, as example, could be risk insurance. Uh, and then we look at uh, adaptation pathways for these uh, flood prone uh, urban regions. Uh, if you divide this overall aim into three different uh, sub aims, the first one would be to assess the drivers, hotspots, dynamics of the risks, not only past, but also today and look into the future, 2030, 2050. And we also would like to look at entry points and in the same time also barriers for implementation of these ecosystem-based solutions uh, or insurance solutions. Um, what kind of solutions can be more socially acceptable and if there are any hurdles for implementing those. In the end, we would like to develop a decision supporting tool uh, which can prioritize adaptation measures, as I mentioned, uh, which are the measures which can be uh, easily accepted by local people, by local communities, and are they cost effective, uh, are they sustainable? Because some of the measures might be uh, good for short term, but for the long term, you need uh, to have certain sustainability. Uh, we work with really very good uh, local partners in Vietnam, but also in, in Germany. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of partners, as you can see on the right side of the slide. Um, this project is funded by the German Ministry of uh, Education and Research. Uh, the project is currently in the definition phase. This is uh, concluding uh, now. Uh, and I'm really happy to announce that um, our uh, proposal for the next phase, which is the R&D phase, research and development phase, was evaluated very um, positively and the funding was confirmed just uh, two weeks ago. So we will receive 1.5 uh, million euros for implementation of um, the results of the definition phase. So that's uh, where we are with um, Flood Adapt Project. Um, now I would like to take you back from Vietnam, Asia, back to Europe and Bonn. And this is where we are based. And uh, we uh, will, now I will ask Dominic to introduce the project series, which focuses on uh, heat stress in Europe and specifically in Bonn. Down. Yes, uh, thanks, Charming, um, and thanks also to our merit colleagues. I think it's a really nice opportunity to exchange and uh, share some experiences across institutes, which I uh, very much appreciate. Um, I'm going to present the project SURIS, uh, which stands for Future Oriented Vulnerability and Risk Analysis as Instrument to Support Urban Infrastructure Resilience. And as Charming already pointed out, this is very crucial also in European cities uh, because here we are faced with a growing risk to heat stress which is actually triggered not only by climate change, but also by social economic change. I mean, if you look at an aging society, if you look at urbanization trends, uh, then it's obviously um, not only related to the temperatures themselves that uh, we have a high growing risk. And um, despite this growing risk, uh, research is still um, kind of back um, and a bit behind because oftentimes um, the focus is really on the hazard side. I mean, I'm sure that uh, each um, of you has already seen some kind of beautiful colored maps uh, where temperatures are showing. Uh, but then really looking at the vulnerability um, is very rare in research. But uh, as I said, it's, it's obviously also very important in order to, um, yeah, to identify these drivers behind the risk. And this was also one of the objectives then of the, of the project to actually look at vulnerability in specific and how vulnerability uh, contributes to risk and also looking at future vulnerability because there uh, we even have less research. So one of the things we did was a participatory um, exercise with the city of Bonn where we also asked different stakeholders um, in which kind of pathways they would uh, see Bonn in terms of development, um, so along growth, so economic growth perspectives, but then also regarding climate change policies and so forth. So to really see, okay, what could the future situation be like in order to then identify, okay, what could the future vulnerability then be like? 
And as you can see also here on the right side of the slide, we really work together closely with different um, sectors like academia, but then really also with the city of Bonn um, and the city of Ludwigsburg as well, like an, another partner city, but also with the private sector and uh, environment consulting. Um, the next slide, please. Thanks so much. Um, so based on that, the second method that we chose was a household survey. And as you can see here on the right side, we actually looked at different socioeconomic groups and how they are affected. And I mean, it's, uh, you probably can't read it, but the most important thing are the colors. So basically the blue shades of these bubbles uh, represent the younger uh, share of the population, while the green shades represent the older part of the population and the brown uh, orange-ish <laughs> shades uh, are then the working age population. And what you can see here is that we actually have um, a very high exposure, but also very high adaptive capacity, not only of the older share of the population, but particularly also of the younger share of the population. And this is something that the that research is not really covering yet, uh, because oftentimes um, risk is well, kind of seen as susceptibility, and then often regarded as uh, kind of a problem of the older population, which is indeed the case, because um, due to different uh, physical conditions uh, and also cardiovascular um, systems of, of all the people that are more susceptible, people are more susceptible. But again, susceptibility is not uh, the only part of the equation of risk. But it, again, um, exposure is very important, such a, or and then also adaptive capacity and coping capacity. So what we identified in here is um, the very important need to not only looking at those kind of classical um, population groups at risk, but also consider those that might have not been considered yet in urban planning, such as younger share of the population. And here we particularly uh, emphasize to look at students because we identified that they have, actually have a very high exposure and also a very low um, adaptive capacity and as well as coping capacity, which is sometimes uh, linked to low income level, but then often students are also new in, in the city that they study and so they don't really know where to go. Um, if, if they want to get some kind of release to heat stress, um, they will obviously rent uh, their property, so they might even not be able to install some of um, yeah some shadings or something that could reduce the heat stress. Um, yeah, so again, uh, the key message of this project is really then okay. It is important to really consider different groups and also look at how they are um, vulnerable, how they are vulnerable to heat stress. And so um, one of our key messages is then basically also um, that in order to plan for climate change and also plan for future uh, socioeconomic change, these vulnerabilities and these differences between groups have to be considered. Um, if you could please move to the next slide. Thanks. Um, and so based on these results that we have, we obviously also came up with some kind of recommendations. Uh, and one of the recommendations that we had uh, was to increase and improve urban green space. Um, because this is not only important to reduce the temperatures, and you can see that on the uh, thermal image on the, on the left side, that the blue areas are often uh, parks and, and open fields that really have a very um, strong cooling effect on the city. But we also realized in our survey that these green spaces also contribute to people's well-being. I mean, being in a park um, is always nice. And, and this, this was also important to households, not only have this kind of physical component, but also feeling good, uh, which contributes to the, to the risk or to the, to the release. Um, and what we also um, realized is that this has to be guided by, by policy and by, by planning. Um, because just to give you an example, uh, maybe the, around 50% of the students, uh, when we asked them if they were um, well able or if they considered to do any kind of adaptation measures in the future, 50% of the students said that they will be willing to um, buy an air conditioning system. And of course, it re uh, reduces the um, direct heat stress. Um, but if you look at future uh, situations, then and, uh, as you probably know, uh, air conditioning systems are always uh, linked to a lot of energy uh, consumption. They're also uh, releasing a lot of heat. So if 50% of the population would install an air conditioning system, then the urban heat island effect would even be bigger. Um, so it's not really a sustainable solution, so to say. Um, and this was also an important, important finding for us uh, to really then look at okay, how can urban planning from the city of Bonn and also other, other actors uh, really inform uh, these adaptation um, decisions. And as a very last point, um, we can also already share that um, we have had a diff uh, kind of similar presentation also 
by two other stakeholders and uh, the Federal Office of Civil Protection Disaster Assistance um, even agreed uh, with us to, to meet up early next year and they are the national focal point for the Sendai implementation, so for the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. I feel this is quite a success for us to really go to the different actors like the city of Bonn, but then also um, with more national actors like the federal office and really share the um, findings that we have from this research, uh, research project. And uh, we are still hopeful that uh, this is kind of a blueprint and to see how science can be really translated into practice and really into planning uh, in order to reduce the, um, the future risk that we have. And uh, with that, I would like to hand over back to you, Shaman. Thanks. You're muted in case you're talking, trying to talk. Dr. Shen. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this is a beginner's mistake. I make it all the time <laughs> after so many Zoom meetings. Um, <clears throat> So the, the two projects were two uh, examples for the projects we have in the Institute. We have um, really quite a lot of projects with a global scale, but also with uh, local case studies. Um, because both of our institutes are UNU institutes. So we are also supposed to be think tanks for the United Nations system, but also for the national governments and communities. Uh, so our research is, <coughs> excuse me, um, always policy relevant. Uh, that's something we um, put a lot of uh, emphasis on as well. Uh, so our research is on the one hand informed by all these international frameworks, such as the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, the Paris Agreement, and of course the SDGs. And on the other hand, with our research results, we also feed back into uh, these frameworks. These are some examples of uh, what we do as feedback to these international frameworks. Uh, I just need to mention um, here two examples. One is the IPCC report. Uh, our senior scientist, also head of one of the sections, um, uh, Zita Zevas, um, Zevis Bavari. She is um, IPCC lead author uh, for one of the spe special reports. Let me see what the title of the report is. Is um, special report on ocean and cryosphere. Uh, which was published just uh, 2019, I think. Uh, so that's one way we feed back with our research results um, back to the international policy domain. Um, and other examples include, for instance, the GAR project, that's the Global Assessment Report of UNDRR. Um, I, I'm not sure if you are familiar with the short forms. This is the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, agency. They are also partly based in Bonn. We work a lot with them. Um, they are currently working on this GAR report and two of our colleagues at the Institute, uh, Michael Hagenlocher and Isabel Misa, are lead authors for the global drought uh, special reports within the GAR report. So these are the examples how we are informed by global frameworks and in the uh, meantime, we feed back into these um, international frameworks. Uh, I guess Merit has similar approach, so I'm going to invite Vatel to our research seminar soon and to see what Merit, Merit does. Um, in the past years, we have actually worked quite a bit together. Uh, UNUEHS is offering the uh, specialization courses for merit uh, for the master in public policy and human development. Um, as I understand that you have once the first semester, like a general course for all the students. In the second semester, the students can choose uh, one of the specializations. And we are offering the specialization on risk and uh, vulnerability. Um, and we also organized together with uh, Merit, uh, Chris Flores and uh, IS, the simulation games. 
Uh, there are three lists here, was G20 simulation uh, 2018 and UN Peace Building Commission uh, 2019. Uh, this year is postponed to 2021 because of coronavirus, but we will uh, do it next year once it's possible. And this one is a simulation for uh, COP. So these are quite exciting um, things we do together. Uh, and last not least is that we share our uh, capacity building for our staff. Uh, we make our classes uh, available to Merit and Merit also makes available your uh, staff training classes um, for, for EHS staff. Uh, next year, beginning of next year, I'm going to roll out a more systematic um, training program for EHS staff and uh, we are for sure make some of the classes available for merit colleagues. So this is the current state of our collaboration. And uh, I'm super excited to work with Batel and with the colleagues at Merit to uh, even more strengthen our collaboration in the future. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, this is, we are here to respond to any of your comments or questions. If I may uh, kick off, maybe. Um, so, so thanks, Xiaoming and Dominic, for your presentations. I think the research that you're doing is 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 very um, important and relevant. Um, we all know that uh, climate change is happening. So, I'm I'm very uh, happy to see the work that you've been doing there. Um, there are, of course, a lot of opportunities to further strengthen our ties and our collaboration. Um, we could think of uh, specific areas to work in. Uh, we could also look at maybe new areas to explore. Um, we are going through a process where we try to identify those, uh, those areas. We're, we're not done yet. Um, but perhaps from your side, where would EHS, in terms of research, want to focus on, on, on new topics? Do you have anything already in mind that you think you could work on or you would want to work on? Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, looked briefly on the web page of Merit. I saw two areas we have been working on the whole time, actually. One is migration. We mm -hmm. focus on environmentally induced migration. I think this concept was created by UNO EHS back in 2007. Uh, we had a huge conference in um, 2008 on this topic. Uh, since then, this has gained international attention. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's certainly an area where we can work. And another area is social protection. We just ran a summer academy in August on the topic of social protection. Mm -hmm. I think these are the existing topics where we can collaborate in the future. Um, in terms of new topic, um, I uh, have made it um, my personal, <laughs> my personal uh, priority and uh, to push forward um, post-COVID recovery. Uh, some people call it green recovery. Uh, uh, some people call it building back better. Whatever you call it, I think we need to use this momentum. Uh, we need to use this opportunity to really stop and think and see how we can do it better. So um, the topic uh, we will be working on is beyond GDP 2030 uh, mm -hmm. and uh, well-being. So it's combined. Um, with that, we also would like to focus on equality uh, matters because if you talk about um, beyond GDP, then there is Global South, which still hasn't arrived at a certain level of um, mm -hmm. material well-being. You cannot ask them to give up even more. So we're mainly talking about Global North, how we can ensure that uh, we don't leave anyone behind and to take Global South on board. Um, so we need to look at equality. So basically beyond GDP, well-being and equality, these are the topics we will start next year. Yeah, that is fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much.
And if I may briefly add to that, uh, we actually have a current project uh, which is on adaptive social protection in Indonesia, where we try to develop a strategy jointly with the government of Indonesia to really also tap into this interface, right, between social protection, which is often coming from a very strong, yeah, also poverty focus, but then also really tapping into uh, disaster risk management and climate change adaptation and really trying to bring these different sectors together. And I feel this is also very emerging and uh, interesting field. I mean, uh, the World Bank has just uh, this year released uh, their flagship report on this topic. And I think a lot of different um, the social protection not all conference was also heavily based on that. So I think this is also something emerging um, that I also see a huge um, yeah, opportunities also for collaboration. Mm. If I may, Sabrina, can I just share my screen very quickly with something? Yes. Um, you should be I need to stop share. Yeah. I have it, I think. Um, this one. Can you see that? Yep. Yes. No, it's I, good. I was attending a seminar yesterday where uh, one of our um, well known people, Luke Sute, who was the previous director, was also presenting. Yeah. Uh, and this is this was a survey that was set out among 18 universities globally in 10 countries this year. And it was a question on what most pressing issue should economists um, look at. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see exactly the words that you mentioned there, Xiaoming. Yeah. Uh, inequality is, is, is a huge concern among students. Um, climate change, poverty, COVID-19, um, the recession and the recovery. It's, it's, it's all there. So I think these are indeed key topics for us as UN University institutes uh, to address. And um, in the talk yesterday, it was about what, what can economists do, because we have a lot of excellent economists in our group. Mm -hmm. um, and the, 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 our, the, the challenge is to bridge uh, the economic modeling and perspectives with uh, social protection, with um, uh, other, other uh, focus. So, so I just wanted to share that with you. And, and I think that that captures nicely what you have just um, mentioned. So I will stop sharing my screen because I took screenshots from that other um, <laughs> today. <laughs> Maybe that was illegal. I don't know. So uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, very good. Yeah, that that's uh, definitely the area we can work very closely together because we don't have uh, much expertise in economics here at UNU EHS, mm -hmm. but we have loads of expertise on risks, vulnerability, climate change. Um, so I think if we combine all the strengths we have, we can definitely do something much yeah. bigger, impactful. Fully agree. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi, Teresa. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. It was great to know you uh, and your work. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And uh, also I have a very practical question um, um, because of my uh, research work, which is uh, based on understanding the risk for jobs uh, and employment in face of the challenges that we face nowadays. Uh, uh, one is automation, this current wave of automation, but also COVID and environmental uh, challenges, right? So I, I was very curious on your feedback, uh, if you could give examples on how uh, either flood or a heat risk could impact in particular certain jobs, given their tasks or work context. Uh, can you give examples of uh, uh, workers that are particularly particularly exposed to the consequences given their, their work context? Yeah, I think um, I can give you some very simple examples. If you think about flooding or heat waves, the construction workers are completely unemployed. Okay, okay. They can't just stand under the sun by 40 degrees and work on a construction site. Yeah. The area is flooded, it's no way for them to uh, work on a construction site. Yeah. So and these are really simple examples. Mm -hmm. And if you think about um, local communities, I, I know Asia very well, especially Southeast Asia. There are a lot of small vendors, right? They are street vendors for food or for mm -hmm. groceries. And if you have a flood event, like in the case of Hui in Vietnam, 
there's no way for them to go to the streets and sell their stuff. Yeah. Um, their, their livelihood is all depending on that. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I don't see many uh, screens with uh, <laughs> video switched on. I can Appear relate. Yeah. May, I, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. sure. Yes, uh, Xiaomeng and uh, Dominique, thank you for your presentation. I would have a, a question to Xiaomeng concerning uh, the, uh, the heat stress in the area of Bonn. You mentioned that students are affected. I can, I can see that older people would be affected. But why would students be affected? Is that simply the result of the, uh, the survey that you made? And of course, if you ask somebody, you know, are you happy or could things be better? They will always find something to complain about. Mm. What is really the problem with students and heat wave? Okay. Oh, well, this is a project Dominic is heavily involved in. Um, Dominic will, will complement what I'm going to say. Uh, I can speak from my personal experience. I used to be a student in Bonn. And I lived, I lived in a, in a uh, Dominic, how do you say, um, Dachwohnung? Uh, attic story. Yeah, attic story. So on the top of the building, uh, which had uh, quite low ceiling and it's on the top. It was just so hot, it was just so hot. And on some days it was so unbearable that I really had to go out and to go to the parks and to, to read uh, there. For me, it was impossible to take any of the measures. I didn't have the money to buy um, ACs. I didn't have the money to create a more solid shade, for instance. Um, so I did consider myself to belong to the vulnerable group. <laughs> okay. But uh, Dominic, from the project point of view, um, please uh, add anything you want to add. Well, exactly. I think the, the first aspect you, you've mentioned quite, uh, quite nicely, I mean, we have to look at two aspects. One is the exposure. And obviously, um, we, we see that uh, the areas or the, the hotspots of heat stress are really attic stories, but then, for example, also public transport. And if you look at students, they, uh, they have a very high share of people actually using these public transport and thus being exposed to heat. The second aspect that was also mentioned already uh, was kind of the capacities to cope, but also adapt. Um, it is not only linked to, to the income level, so not being able to buy AC, um, but then also linked to the, to the social networks. And I feel this is very important because we realize that um, Households that live longer and maybe also in houses and they are quite well established with the neighborhood and then they might be, you know, able to ask their neighbors if they can go shopping for them, um, if they can maybe uh, sleep there if, if, the, if the temperatures are like getting unbearable in their own place, if they can maybe borrow a, a fan or some kind of ventilation equipment and this is all uh, something that we experienced that uh, is not really the case for students because oftentimes, again, they're not that well linked uh, to their environment, to their neighborhoods, um, and again, um, don't really have the options to cope or uh, neither to, uh, to adapt. And I feel these, these two aspects are the most important. Mm, okay. But so in more generally, it, it would also be uh, the case of uh, people with low income. Could not be a lot of, a lot of people also with low income might live in the Arctic and be affected by climate, by heat wave in the same way as students are. Definitely. So it's a more general problem. I mean, students yeah. is just one particular population that is affected. Yes, but then uh, again, it really depends uh, on what kind of population you looked at uh, on the lower end of, of the income level, right? I mean, uh, if you look at a younger population who then might still live with their families, of course, they also have a low income, but then the household income would again be a bit higher and also they would maybe then still live in a house um, where you would not face uh, such a high exposure. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, perhaps picking on, if I may, picking on what Pierre said, uh, some jobs, uh, they are um, in areas where they are typically precarious jobs. So again, associated uh, with the lack of resources to face these challenges. Um, would you find useful if someone, you or a collaboration, if someone come up with an index of uh, risks by job, by, by type of jobs in face of uh, 
uh, the various uh, dimensions of um, risks to climate change. So you have uh, a heat, a flood, but and other factors. And would you find useful for us to have such an index? I think absolutely. I think that would be great. If you could collaborate on this index, this is fantastic because um, people love uh, figures, numbers, and graphs. If you could create such an index, we can publish it weekly or monthly on both of our web pages. That would be fantastic. Wonderful. That's my, yeah. my part. The, the, <laughs> the yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll write to you soon. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much for this idea. It's fantastic. Thank I you. love it. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Do we have more questions? We still have some time left. Maybe if I may, an another question to Xiaoming. You were talking about classes that you're organizing in Bonn. Is this classes for students or is this classes for your uh, staff members or for uh, other people? <clears throat> You mean the training uh, for staff? Um, by that, yes, I mean, yes. Uh, yes, both for, for both groups, for master students and also for staff, um, okay. for all researchers and also uh, on senior level. Because um, to be honest, we haven't had a very systematic uh, staff training program at mm -hmm. the Institute. Uh, that was um, already on my agenda before I came because I thought we need this. Um, and I wanted, to, of course, to find out first if we had it. I don't want to repeat anything. Mm -hmm. I found out there wasn't any systematic investment in staff. Uh, I think, uh, as you know, we have the 60 year rule at UNU. People come and leave. I thought one thing is to create, uh, uh, or to increase their capacity before they leave. Uh, and another thing is to give them some something back because they, at least I can say for my people, they're all overcommitted, so enthusiastic about their work. I want to give them something back. So I wanted to establish this um, systematic um, program, both mm. for um, staff and master students. Oh, well, you have a master's program as well. At, yes, at we have a joint master's program oh, with the yes. University of Bonn. I see. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Very well. Maybe I can save you a couple of minutes of Zoom meeting. Exactly. I was, uh, <laughs> if there are no more questions, um, Sabrina, is it okay if I say uh, the final words? Please go ahead. Thank you. So it's important to note, uh, Xiaoming and uh, Dominic, that these seminar series are organized by uh, volunteers from the Institute and uh, students and staff. So um, thank you. Um, Sabrina for uh, hosting this uh, event and the others that you organize. Um, it has been uh, wonderful to uh, get to know a bit more about what you do at EHS and uh, to get some insights into the research and in your vision um, on research and uh, policy impact, especially, I think, which is relevant for, um, for all of us. Um, we will meet again, um, hopefully face to face uh, as soon as we can travel. But we also um, would be happy to extend another invitation for another event, maybe not a seminar, but um, I think we all feel the need for a party slowly coming up. So uh, maybe we do a joint EHS merit party or so at some that point. That would be fantastic. Good. Let's do yes. it. As a, as a long term, no, medium term ambition. Medium term ambition. Yeah. Yes, I totally support it. Yeah. And uh, I'm so happy that you invited me. And thank you so much for organizing this seminar. And at our institutes, we also have a colloquy uh, program. So to that, I'm going to invite Bartel as the first presenter of MERIT. Uh, you will receive <laughs> the invitation you. pretty soon. And we will continue our conversation. I really enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Once so again, much. thank you very much. Be happy to uh, oblige and uh, join.